All right, now we'll get started. Good afternoon and welcome to NOAA's National Ocean Service Science Seminar Series. If you are interested in being on NOAA's weekly science seminar list, just email me or Google NOAA Seminar to find out more. And so today is the seventh in an eight-part climate science seminar series, co-hosted by Katie Reeves of the U.S. Global Change Research Program and myself, Tracy Gill from NOAA. I'm going to provide a few logistics about today's seminar, and then Katie will introduce the seminar and the speaker. We have, a switch, we have switched to Adobe Connect for this seminar series to accommodate more participants and to record the seminar. The recording and a PDF of the presentation will be available a few days after the webinar, and we will be posting a link to that recording PDF in the chat box. Feel free to ask questions in the chat box, and we will try to respond as soon as they come, but we may need to wait till, till the end. People in the room, please sign in and silence your phones. And if you want to make the presentation bigger, I finally found out how to do it. There's a little icon in the upper right of your screen, and um, it looks like four arrows, either pointing in or out. You click on that screen, and it should toggle it in or out. So that's how you make your screen bigger. And I think that also eliminates the chat and possibly the closed captioning, which is currently below the presentation. And now Katie's going to introduce our seminar and presenter for today. Katie? Great. Thank you, Tracy. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us for the seventh installment of the Climate Science Special Report webinar series. As Tracy said, I'm Katie Reeves. I'm the Engagement and Communications Lead for the U.S. Global Change Research Program, or USGCRP. Um, for a little bit of background, the Global Change Research Act of 1990 mandates that USGCRP assist the nation and the world to understand, assess, predict, and respond to human-induced and natural processes of global change. And one way that we do that is through the development of a mandated quadrennial national climate assessment. The Climate Science Special Report, which is the focus of this eight-part series, represents volume one of the fourth national climate assessment. And it was released in November 2017. Um, I will share a link with you shortly. Um, so this report assesses the science of climate change with a focus on the United States. And it serves as the foundation for volume two of the assessment, which is scheduled for release later this year. And that will look at climate-related impacts, risks, and adaptation across the United States. So you can read and download the Climate Science Special Report at science2017.globalchange.gov. And again, I'll share that uh, with you shortly. Today, I'm pleased to introduce Tidings of the Tides with Dr. William Sweet. Dr. Sweet is a NOAA oceanographer with the Center for Operational Oceanographic Products and Services. His research focuses on changes in nuisance to extreme coastal flood risk due to sea level rise. Um, in addition to his work on Volumes 1 and 2 of the 4th National Climate Assessment, Dr. Sweet has assessed risks to U.S. coastal military installations worldwide for the military. He currently lives in Annapolis, where he witnesses sea level rise firsthand. Thank you, Dr. Sweet, for joining us on today's NOAA Science Seminar. I'll turn it over to you. All right. Well, thank you, everyone. Thanks for uh, joining in during your lunch hour. Um, as Katie mentioned, uh, I'll talk about uh, the 12th chapter of the Climate Science Special Report that focuses on sea level rise um, and the science behind it and uh, the way that sea level rise manifests itself, in particular to high tide flooding, extreme event flooding, uh, and sort of the, the consequences of such. Um, I think this is particularly relevant. and, and to today's world, uh, we're starting to see the impacts now uh, in terms of sea level rise related flooding. Um, we're witnessing the other changes as well, you know, extreme heat and drought and intense rainfall. Uh, I think the sea level rise story is, is, is fascinating because it's, we're really talking about a phase of matter, um, the ocean the water that's quite tangible. It, it gets your feet wet and it's starting to do that more often. And so it's uh, something that, uh, you can't really escape from. You can't go in and turn on your air conditioning and, and claim that you don't see any changes in heat or, or, or you know, nighttime heat or what have you. It's, it's wet and uh, people are noticing it. So with that, uh, we'll, we'll get started. Sea level's rising and it's been rising. Um, and we have ways of assessing this change. So we'll sort of go through some of the key messages and, and sort of the story behind it. Uh, but so key message one, uh, global mean sea level. So on average across the globe, uh, sea level has risen seven to eight inches since 1900, uh, with about three inches of that in the last 
25 years or so. Uh, we, we know this from basically these uh, data sets we see here are different. Or one is an altimeter uh, reconstruction of global sea level rise, basically a direct measurement. Uh, and the three longer uh, records are based on a uh, global network of tide gauges and the various methods that uh, statistically you can start to uh, parse out the global rise signal. So there is a little bit of variability, but the underlying message is, is that sea level has been rising um, and the accumulated rise in the last 25 years is, is quite significant compared to the, uh, the century prior. Um, and that uh, that's important because it's sort of that's where we live uh, in today's world, and the the rise rate isn't uh, likely to to abate. Continuation of that message is that human caused climate change has made a substantial contribution to the global sea level rise since 1900. So um, this is just a snapshot out of CNN uh, yesterday. I think we were talking. Uh, nationally about whether or not to um, control emissions but uh, as you'll see throughout but particularly in, in this key message you know emissions matter um, there's definitely a relationship between co2 temperature and sea level um, and uh, the modeling efforts that um, have looked into this uh, you know sort of the counterfactual world if, if we didn't have this additional heating uh, different uh, emissions related uh, heating throughout the 20th century, you know, what would the outcome have been? Um, that outcome would have been less sea level rise. Um, and so that's important, a substantial, uh, significant fraction, upwards of 50% or more of sea level rise that's happened in the last 100 years or so, um, even more so in the last 50 years, is, is attributable to human-related uh, causes. And you know, as we not only is it emissions and heating, but then and we'll get into this in another component here. It's just land use and management practices in general. Uh, the land subsidence component, humans are sort of uh, exacerbating a, a component of that. So not only is it the ocean rise, but the land sinking as well. The humans actually have a, uh, a you know really only can blame ourselves to an extent. So when we look at this, let's say over the last. Um, couple thousand years or so in the continuation of that key message. Um, so that rate uh, over the last century is, is uh, greater than any uh, century rate rise in the last almost 3,000 years. And this is based on geological sort of uh, reconstructions of sea level using uh, marsh grasses and others that sort of have a uh, there's a certain amount of uncertainty associated with that, but decimeter scale and, and what um, Bob Kopp had done in, in a paper uh, basically was putting together these geological reconstructions with um, some other uh, researchers, Carly Hay here, uh, tide gauge reconstruction and satellite to really start to parse together what are the likely rates of sea level rise have been. And so it really sort of shows that where we are now is, is pretty unique over the last several thousand years. Um, so again, that storyline of you know sea level is rising. Um, the current rate is is higher than the century uh, prior and uh, the 1900, and that that rate itself is is unique, and that humans are largely you know have a significant role in 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 this uh, what's unfolding here in terms of global sea level rise. So. <clears throat> Just to sort of clarify a little bit, what we're talking about thus far is global um, sea level rise. And a few acronyms, will, I'll try to make sure to clarify sea level rise. Um, I'll use another acronym uh, shortly here looking global mean sea level. And there'll be another one that'll be relative sea level. So sea level is just sort of a blanket acronym for whether it's global or, or relative local sea level rise. But I'll make sure to uh, try to distinguish between. But on a global basis, we know that um, the ocean itself is ch changing um, due to basically three, two main reasons. A third uh, is, is important to an extent. One um, is land-based uh, ice melt. So where we have ice in Antarctica and Greenland and Alpine glaciers, when it melts, the water goes in the ocean. Thermal expansion is the water warms, the volume changes. Uh, and then the third component, which is sort of uh, dependent upon the, the actual disturbance, would be uh, 
changes in land water storage. So when we have a lot of impoundments or dam building that happened in the 50s and 60s, maybe you retain some water. So during the hydrologic cycle, it rains and the water gets on land and it gets stored on land. Uh, what we're witnessing now is a lot of groundwater pumping for, for drinking reasons and irrigation. And so you remove water that's in a reservoir subsurface, terrain water, and now it uh, gets into sort of the surface layer and the river runoff into the ocean. And so you can actually uh, increase to a, a smaller extent the ocean volume due to changes in land storage. And we measure this, and we uh, do a very good job at, at measuring the components. So um, sort of, as we said, the current ocean rise here, if, if we were uh, making a cake, uh, and the ingredients would be sort of one part thermal expansion, two parts uh, land-based ice melt, and voila, we'd have a, a, a cake made of those two components. In this case, it's really the ocean. Um, and so we're, we're measuring that. And what we show here on the graph is the black line on the graph is altimeter, uh, which is, again, sort of the, at this point, the gold star, sort of direct measurement of the ocean surface uh, uh, with great spatial and temporal resolution to, to really accurately determine how the sea surface height is changing um, on average. And what we see is the red line is Argo. Uh, it's basically the thermal expansion measured by Argo, which are these profilers that go up and down in the ocean column and measure more or less the change in temperature change in density of the of the water column. Um, the blue is was measured uh, by GRACE um, and follow on GRACE is active now so we'll have a continued measurement there that are actually really neat set of satellites that trail each other and uh, the constant of gravity is directly relation, uh, proportional to the mass and so as they two trail each other where the leading satellite goes over a more massive area um, through the mass through the center of the Earth, it speeds up compared to the other satellite behind it. And they measure their distance with a radar, and they can determine then the through time the change in mass and the distribution of mass on the on Earth. And so not only is it telling us things of how groundwater and aquifers may be depleting, but it's also telling us of how ice sheets themselves, how ice is being redistributed from locked in ice to elsewhere, and that elsewhere would be melting water. And so when you add the two together, the red plus blue equals green, and you overlay green onto the black, voila, you more or less close the sea level budget. We understand uh, the components and the processes affecting global sea level. Um, and <clears throat> it's important to note that there's a departure of this ratio. It, it, the land-based ice melt now is picked up in terms of the overall um, uh, ratio of, of contribution to the global rise. So uh, the melt is picking up. Um, but we know that sea level rise globally is not uniform. It's not like water rising as it would in a bathtub. Um, and so there's reasons why the, the ocean isn't flat. Um, we, we figured that out. It doesn't just drop off the edge of space. The ocean it's, where it's lived on a curved sphere, and we have winds and currents that push water around, and we have perturbations about that. Uh, the pattern we see here is measured in satellites since the uh, middle of 1992 or so, and you can see some patterns of higher sea level rise in the western Pacific, uh, areas in the, uh, the U.S. Atlantic coast and the Gulf of Mexico has been seeing uh, relatively high rates of sea level rise. Some areas on the West Coast have seen less sea level rise in the last few decades. This isn't necessarily a pattern that's been persistent before this time, and it's not necessarily the pattern that's expected to persist in the future, um, though there are some underlying reasons why we, we do see major boundary currents and, and so forth that would tend to reflect some of these patterns. Um, but again, it's important because what you see now isn't necessarily what's going to happen in the future, but it's definitely a, a component of why uh, maybe impacts have been playing out the way they have. You know, areas, the Marshall Islands and others where these king tides really just come walking.
Hi, folks. Hold on. We had a, we lost our connection. Hi guys, we're coming back on. Can you see the screen okay? Thank you. And uh, Billy, go ahead and let's make sure people can hear you and give people a chance to pop back on. All right. Hi folks, we're back. <laughs> Sorry about that. I think where we left off with the ocean was rising. Hold on one second. <clears throat> Great. So, um, to distinguish between globalized and localized, the other component that we measure uh, is through tide gauges. And I work for the group that runs all the tide gauges at NOAA. And uh, we have records of you know, the tide gauges being used um, originally for shipping, maritime commerce, high water, low water, when's a good time to bring in the ships, when's not a good time, tide predictions when you go to the beach and high tide is going to be at 6.34 p.m. and low tide will be, you know, that kind of thing, storm <coughs> surge monitoring. But now through long records, we also start to measure uh, local relative sea level uh, change. And in this case, it's the ocean component as well as whatever your land is doing. Is your land sinking as it is along most, a lot of the mid-Atlantic and, and areas of the Gulf? We'll talk more about that in a few later slides. Or land might be rebounding, rising up, but none the, as it is in, in Alaska and some other areas. Um, but nonetheless, that's an apparent, it's a real relative change. And uh, that's uh, ultimately what is impacting at a, a location. So it's certain areas in the mid-Atlantic, local relative sea level rise is increasing three, four, five millimeters a year, you know, an inch every five to eight years or so. In the Gulf, uh, there's areas where sea level is rising five to millimeters, almost a centimeter a year, you know, an inch every five years to two to three years. So it's not trivial. It starts to add up, especially when we uh, are referencing fixed elevations like the infrastructure that we might have built 50 years ago. More about that coming up. Key message two. So we know sort of the, where we are now, what's happened, you know, what's likely to unfold, you know, what can we plan on? You know, there are a lot of people make decisions, they, whether it's uh, building, fortifying against flooding, or if it's buying a house, um, or if it's a municipality determining, you know, for stormwater reasons, you know, where's water going to be, the ecology, um, you know, wetlands, there's, there's a host of reasons that people need to have information about what's likely to unfold. Um, so relative to the year 2000, when, when a lot of these estimates are, are, are centered and framed upon, uh, global mean sea level is assessed to be very likely to rise um, somewhere between, uh, and I'll stick to the feet, uh, try to give meters of feet, and sorry if, if I flip back and forth, but 0.3 to 0.6 feet by 2030, uh, 0.5 to 1.2 feet by 2050, and somewhere between 1 and maybe 4.3 feet by 2100. So again, there is some uh, uh, range as to what's uh, likely or very likely. In this case, sort of the 90% probability based on probabilistic estimates are somewhat conditional upon future emissions. And that's where you sort of get this span, the low end being sort of the continuation of the current rate and the, uh, the higher, the 4.3 being sort of that likely range under a higher emission scenario, the RCP 8.5, which more or less is the, Appears to be the trajectory that we're currently on. Um, it's important to note that uh, future pathways, meaning you know whatever emission pathways we may or may not be on, 2.6 RCP 4.5 or 8.5 are these representation concentration pathways of, of emissions, more or less. Um, whatever occurs doesn't really have much effect on projections of, of global mean sea level rise in the first half of the century, uh, but really starts deviating in the second part. So, you know, more or less, we're kind of on the path we are maybe for the next few decades, but uh, the our outcome is more uncertain and is maybe a little bit more in our hands. You know, our collective understanding as to the causes and then the consequences, uh, it's conditional probability. So it's hard to determine how humans are going to react, and therefore you have some uh, large uh, potential uncertainty as to what may uh, unfold in terms of global rise. 
So to feed into the Climate Science Special Report and the National Climate Assessment, the latest assessment, um, we worked on an uh, uh, interagency report uh, that basically looked at framing scenarios of sea level rise. And uh, scenarios are used, be again, because it's sort of largely uncertain as to the outcomes, dependent upon human, uh, among others, you know, human influences. Um, and that was documented in a report um, last year. And more or less the outcomes of that is we provided uh, six scenarios. We started at a low end scenario of 0.3 meters rise by 2100, and, uh, <clears throat> which is very likely, and we'll, we'll talk about that, or extremely likely to be surpassed, um, all the way up to a 2.5 meter rise by 2100, which is very unlikely to occur, but not unfeasible, plausible, and, and there are certain types of decision making that need to know what are the uh, very unlikely outcomes that could have significant consequences if they do occur. Um, and then we kind of uh, discretize this by half meter increments, 0 0.5, 1, 1 1.5, 2 meters by 2100 to allow sort of alignment with um, a lot of decisions and, and projections that had already been made on some local and state levels and we wanted to allow sort of a uh, an alignment, let's say, with some uh, outcomes that might have already been decided upon, but recognizing that there's a lot of municipalities, a lot of cities that uh, and states that may not really have gotten that far along of assessing the science and coming up with outcomes, whereas others like South Florida Compact um, are you know have a lot of researchers very progressive in terms of uh, taking a, uh, a you know a, a development of curves to, to guide city planning, a, a range. Nonetheless, this was to align. Um, what we see in those colored boxes on the right-hand side of the graph are sort of the 90% probability span of, of assessed studies. We looked at five or six studies that all kind of had a probabilistic framework based upon these uh, future missions. And so that sort of gives you a, um, a, a span, let's say, of, of what the five and ninety fifth percentile, the very uh, the like very likely range of outcomes um, under these RCPs, um, and what you see in the white colored lines that sort of augment the boxes uh, are basically a representation of additional uh, rise based on uh, future or ongoing modeling efforts that are, are better characterizing Antarctica's instabilities of the rice sheets, at least a, a, a few studies that are looking at that to say, compared to uh, COPS 2014, which uh, provided a lot of the framework of the way we approached the development of the scenarios, sort of augmented by the median Antarctic contributions um, between these studies. So to give an idea that you know there is uh, uncertainty right now in how Antarctica is going to respond. There's a mounting ev evidence that the instability in Antarctica and especially the West Antarctic uh, uh, area is, is greater than we had once thought. So these outcomes, uh, though, are somewhat unlikely to occur. The larger amounts is not to say that they won't. And evidence now suggests that they're more likely than previously thought. So some of the storylines or interpretations of these outcomes, I'll I'll stress too here for a moment will be the intermediate low and the intermediate. And the idea is that sort of the intermediate low, sort of the low end of the of the uh, likely range of RCP 4.5, you know, if collectively we start um, controlling emissions in the later half of the, this, the century and, and actually start bringing them under, under control, compared to the intermediate, which is the sort of the high end of the likely range of RCP 8.5. So it sort of spans a... Um, sort of the likely low end and upper end ranges of 4.5 and 8.5. So again, kind of back to that 0.5 to 1 meter uh, global rise that is sort of in this likely range, depending on what we do with our scenarios. As you get to these higher, it's again, it's becoming less likely, but again, you can't completely rule out that these outcomes wouldn't happen. And so looking at this is sort of the, our key message is this emerging science regarding the Antarctic ice sheet stability that suggests for high emission scenarios, as, as we were just discussing, global mean sea level rise exceeding, let's say, eight feet by 2100 is possible. It's physically possible, though 
Uh, it's, it's really sort of hard to assess sort of the probability of, of that kind of outcome. Um, but again, for these very, uh, very low risk uh, type of, of building that you may need, whether it's, you know, flood walls that can't fail or there's a lot of consequences, you know, these kind of outcomes are important to help, you know, plan. Again, if it's not 2100, we'll look at this 2200. So it's sea level is not stopping. But looking at some of the improvements in ice sheet modeling, largely working with, uh, with folks like uh, DeCalto and Pollard, for instance, was a, a really important paper that came out looking at these ideas of, you know, what, what is it that we can model differently that's currently being modeled in sort of this ice shelf hydrofracturing where you start collecting water and melt from atmospheric side of things that start to increase stress and, and stability of these um, marine ice sheets. Uh, ice cliff failures, as you start to get retreat, you get larger exposures, buttresses of ice, they themselves become uh, more unstable and are unable to support the own weight of their ice. And so you start putting these um, uh, features into the models and they do a better job sort of recreating historical uh, features and, and overall amounts of, of contributions of Antarctica and, and others it starts to tune the models in ways that suggest that there are these feedbacks that weren't very well modeled that is still an ongoing part of research right now through observation and modeling, but again, improving the overall uh, uh, understanding of how ice sheets work to improve the models to start um, providing you know, better estimates of what future sea level rise, dependent upon uh, contributions of, of ice in Antarctica and Greenland could be. So, and as we mentioned, to finish out, round out key message two, you know, regardless of pathway, it's extremely likely that global mean sea level will continue to rise beyond 2100. You know, oftentimes overall rise amounts are really framed by sort of the end of century. Um, it doesn't stop there. Time goes on and sea level is like very likely, extremely likely to continue to rise. And so uh, you can frame outcomes of 2100. If not then, maybe 50 years beyond that, maybe 100 years beyond that. There's momentum built into the, this change. And, uh, partial, a lot of way that a lot of the sort of these uh, statistical models based on um, past evidence are sort of tuned to uh, various reconstructions of, of, of temperature, of CO2, of sea level, and the way that we can look back at the past of similar instances where we had similar temperatures and similar CO2 levels, um, and what were sea levels? So we look at present and we sort of look at our CO2 levels and our temperature, and that's what this uh, graphic show of Andrew Dutton's work. Um, and you look at the, not necessarily where ice is coming from spatially within Greenland and Antarctica, it's just sort of the contribution. And so we see basically at the last interglacial 125,000 years ago, sea level was, there is some uncertainty here, somewhere between six and nine meters, but temperatures weren't all that different than they are now in terms of pre-industrial levels and CO2 levels really weren't that different. So it sort of looked at this sort of longer equilibrium state of the ocean as to you know what ultimate rise could be. Uh, we look back three million years ago and there's more uncertainty as to what sea levels were. We're 10 to 30 meters higher. Um, temperatures were uh, more or less up where some of these higher emission scenarios go. Um, and, and CO2 and temperature. But then you look up at the 2100 under RCP 8.5, sort of where, sort of off the chart up there. So it just really goes to show that we're, we're sort of playing with an, an, un, you know, an outcome that we're really not able to very well quantify in terms of uh, historical sort of hindcast looking. So we're sort of going into a you know, new territory here. And so there's a lot of risk. There should be a, a pause to, to think, especially those of us who live along the coast and we're all connected to the coast in terms of supply lines as overall risk, flood insurance. There's lots of reasons for us all to be, uh, to, to stop and pause and, and look at these relationships. Um, even though we've lived on this earth and we think we've lived where we've lived for the last 50 years, 100 years, few hundred years, um, there's, a, there's a bigger story there. So we did provide projections out to 2200 under the sort of the current scenarios. Um, and again, uh, rise could be significant. Um, it could be less significant. And again, the outcomes are, uh, again, based upon the probabilistic framework that we were dealing with, the information that we have now, and that's likely to continue to evolve and change and mature. But the, there, it's 
it's important to realize that this is something that's going to, it's occurring now, it's going to continue to occur and very likely to, to ramp up and it's not stopping at 2100. Key message three, as you said, it's not a water in a bathtub. There's gonna be reasons why there's areas that are going to be higher or lower than the global average. Uh, and relative sea level, so again, relative, more locally, what's land doing, as well as what's the ocean doing, uh, this central will vary along the U.S. coastline, due in part to changes of the Earth's gravitational field and rotation from melting of land ice, changes in ocean circulation, and vertical land motion. And so looking at the schematic, um, vertical land motion, we get it, there's subsidence, it could be uh, human-induced uh, pumping of groundwater, which is an issue a lot of coastal aquifers in the mid-Atlantic, that's where you get your water. Um, could be pumping of, of withdrawal of, of hydrocarbons, subsurface oil and gas. You remove a liquid, uh, the, the, the sediment compacts. You get huge compaction in like some of the areas of inland in California pumping the groundwater. You know, they've documented, what, tens of meters that have dropped. There's just not an ocean rushing in to take its place. So uh, really the land use practices is an issue. I live at the coast in Annapolis. We pump groundwater. Um, and uh, we measure, the USGS measures that. So it's, it's, a, it's a factor. It could be glacier isostatic adjustment from the last time we had the major glacier ice advances, you know, 20,000 years ago or so. And as it started to retreat, it pushed the mantle material down. It might have caused it to, uh, to go down right underneath the ice, and it bulges out where this mantle then was sort of shoved and squirted out where the ice wasn't. And now that's sort of uh, going back into equilibrium, a very slow process. Um, ocean circulation, the Gulf Stream, and I actually have a few slides, so I'll, I'll, I won't belabor too much. And ice effects, where gravitationally, uh, you have a lot of uh, mass locked up into these ice masses. And as it melts, uh, it releases its gravitational attraction, so water actually will go down near these ice uh, masses and go elsewhere. And so when we look at that, when we look at, let's say, the gravitational field and rotation effects of melting land ice, so here would be sort of a uh, sort of an equilibrium uh, adjustment as associated with this. And then you look at the various major ice sources around the world, Greenland ice sheet in A, uh, West Antarctic ice sheet in B, East Antarctic ice sheet in C, and Alpine glaciers, sort of the median of them as you start to look holistically around the, the, the globe of where they are. And so how you interpret this is for every foot, let's say, in this case, the legend would say foot per century, that would be contributing to global rise. Um, are you feeling that whole uh, addition locally? So if there's, let's say, a one foot rise, uh, foot per century rise, if you are red or magenta, you're feeling slightly more than the global. And if you're a color that's sort of the orange and yellow, you're less. So where do we lose ice matters? So the Greenland ice sheet, or the East Coast is closer to it, so you might not feel the whole effect. Greenland contributes a foot of sea level rise, and you only feel uh, three quarters of a foot rise in New York City. Okay, that's an offset. That's good to an extent of, of flood risk. Um, look at West Antarctic ice sheet everywhere, everywhere in the United States. West Antarctic ice sheet is a problem for the United States. Poor Hawaii is getting it from everywhere. East Antarctic ice sheet, the median of glaciers, it's far away from all ice sources. So again, it's this is a sort of a, something that's not varying on a year-to-year -year basis, but it's something as ice starts to, uh, as mass redistributes, here's the response. Changes in circulation and, and heat in the ocean. An example would be the Gulf Stream. And this was a schematic that we had in the 2009 paper. I think it's been adapted maybe by the group at Virginia Institute of Marine Sciences and, and others and ODU. A lot of people have been looking at this lately. The Gulf Stream, as it changes in transport, will affect coastal sea levels. And, uh, and as it speeds up, you have a drop along the coast. And as it slows down, you have a rise along the coast. And it's that's just due to physics. We could talk about geostrophy and all these physical terms we won't, but it's more or less um, a, 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 a real force and a, a real consequence of, of distribution of heat and changes in circulation. Um, and we'll, we'll see sort of a summation of all these processes here in a moment. Um, vertical land motion. 
Uh, we estimated it through a, a slightly different manner here, but just as an illustrative example of showing the GPS derived vertical land motion around the U.S., and you really start to pull out some of these signals of glacial ice static adjustment of uh, sort of as it goes across the, the heartland of the United States um, into areas of rebound, of some local rebound occurring on some gla uh, glaciers up in Alaska. The uh, vertical, the, the, uh, the land uh, compaction in the Gulf that we're mentioning, whether it's sediment compaction in the Mississippi or if it's oil and uh, gas withdrawal in areas of Texas, you know, you can see it. It's real and it's likely to continue unless the disturbance stops. Maybe the human-induced disturbance, we might be able to stem that, but not necessarily the ongoing natural uh, processes of glacial ice static adjustment. For almost all future global mean sea level rise scenarios, relative sea level rise is likely to be greater than the global average in the northeast of the U.S. and the western Gulf of Mexico. So let's look. Here are all six scenarios based at year 2100 outcomes. Um, and the way you interpret this is if you are at 1 or 1 1.5 or 2, if you're above 1 color, you are um, at that ratio multiplied by whatever. So the global rise, let's say in the top left corner of the low scenario, would be 0.3 meters. If you're sort of in a red and you're 1.5 or 2, you're twice the global rise and so forth. And so you can sort of see the northeast largely do in the uh, the Western Gulf largely to, to vertical land motion um, is basically higher than global. In the intermediate low uh, global rise scenarios, relative is likely to be less than global average in much of the Pacific Northwest and Alaska. And so there, again, it's going to be some of this vertical land motion. It's going to be the fact that you're close to the ice and as it melts, this, this gravitational rotational effects. For high global mean sea level scenarios, uh, the, the relative sea level rise likely to be higher than the global average along the coast, most of all the coasts outside of Alaska. So you look at sort of the 1.5, the 2, the 2.5, largely due to this gravitational rotational effects we were discussing. Uh, and then basically along all the coastlines are going to experience greater than global in response to Antarctic ice loss. So, Again, where you lose ice matters. And it really has sort of a built-in factor of risk. You know, you start looking at uh, New York City or Boston versus Seattle. One's expected under all scenarios to have much higher sea level rise or to an extent higher sea level rise than the other. What does that mean about, you know, naval bases and things like that? That, you know, that's why we provided this kind of information to the military for them to start to become aware of just what the physics are telling us. Message four, the sea level rise have risen. The number of tidal floods each year that cause minor impacts, aka nuisance floods, have increased five to tenfold since the 60s in several U.S. locations. So here's sort of the three poster child, you know, sites of, of sea level rise flooding is what it is. We built back in the 60s. You didn't build where the tides hit you because that would have been, that would have gotten you fired as an engineer. But now sea level has risen and now, Tides and typical storms are starting to become impactful. And this, this lady in Miami, she looks like she's seen a lot in this world, and this is another one of these things that just are coming away. We're having water in the streets. Charleston, they've seen their flooding and they're building expensive pumps to get ambulances to the hospital. Miami Beach is building expensive pumps. Skip Styles here, he he's just can't believe it. Look, this is Norfolk. This is happening 10 times a year. There's water in the streets, and they're starting to take pictures of it to remind people of where it is and to plan accordingly. So here's an example. If we look at the highest tides in it, in it uh, daily highest tides over a five year period relative to a flood level in Norfolk here where water's in the streets causing problems and we just sort of play it forward, you know, nothing's really changed. I mean, we have seasonal, you have a few big events that come through, but now just everything's becoming more impactful. The tides are changing. It used to be big storms called flooding and now it's more typical tides and rather typical wind events that are starting to become impactful. And so when we looked at this at 28 areas around the country using these National Weather Service threat thresholds of when they uh, will issue coastal flood advisories, uh, you see that it's just sort of growing in leaps and bounds. Uh, and these thresholds do vary a little bit in elevation, at least in this figure as we were assessing it, 
So the areas with high thresholds there, you might have a giant seawall. You're not really seeing nuisance flooding. Uh, flooding happens once the seawall is breached during a hurricane, and then it's wouldn't call it really nuisance flooding. So anyways, uh, there's definitely some areas that are really, you know, since the since 1960s are really having, you know, large five to tenfold increases. More importantly, the rates of increase of tidal flooding are accelerating in dozens of Atlantic and Gulf Coast cities. And so that's, that's important. So if we look at Norfolk and look sort of at typical uh, probability distribution, which represents area under the curve in any given year or so during a decade, that would be the height above mean high water. You know, they're less big events, less very low water events, and typically more things around, you know, the middle here with the stretches within, you know, 0.4 to negative 0.4, maybe a meter or so. Due to sea level rise relative to these thresholds, you're entering a very non-linear response here, and now it's a quadratic. So even though sea level rise may not be accelerating, your impacts are. And that's problematic because once you realize you have a problem, oh gosh, water's coming up through the storm drains again. Water's here, water's there. It's not going to be a slow, gradual change. It's going to be on you rather quickly, and it's going to become a chronic issue. And so when we do this trend characterization, where are you linearly increasing? Maybe on the West Coast or some areas where it's not quite as monotonically increasing, it's punctuated, but statistically it's a linear fit. We start to say, wow, you know, you're already accelerating it, it. And this is based on these nationally consistent thresholds of about one and three quarters to two feet above high tide. You know, there's a lot of land area there. So it's, uh, it's really lit up on the East Coast right now. So you, you might have flood insurance because you're in the flood zone. Um, but there's a lot of hot spots, or rather I might say wet spots, occurring within that where the, the flood risk is very different. So it really becomes an elevation game once it's driven by tides. It's more bathtub-like. So when we do an average, and what we saw from uh, when we statistically kind of average this around the country, um, uh, you can see sea level, and this is in a report you can go look, but it's sort of a, a nationwide issue and it's it's really growing so these smaller events you know the the frequency and probably the cumulative indirect effects of them are really starting to become more of a national issue um key message for continuing tidal flooding will continue increasing in depth frequency and extent future sea level rise if we're now more or less uh and we have these projections this would be the local scenario projections, let's say for Norfolk, and we're making these products at NOAA so everyone can kind of track along to see what sea level has been doing relative to these scenarios. So when we assess those future sea level rise scenarios relative, let's say, to the, the flood impacts where there's, you know, it's not, it's disruptive, it's not outright damaging yet, um, you know, it really just balloons. And of course, you know, the, the more severe is getting more severe too, and this is really assessing at that threshold it's very colorful. I don't think it's, it's uh, the picture that people want to see. Um, and so when we look around on average by 2050, if this intermediate, lower intermediate, the likely range is what's likely to occur. You know, the days per year, it really, by mid-century, by the end of century, um, you know, mean high tide line is 182 days per year. Uh, by more or less by definition. So, you know, once you get above 180 days per year, you're, I mean, your high tide is at your doorstep. You know, you've made changes long before that. Key message five, assuming storm characteristics do not change, sea level rise will still increase the frequency and extent of extreme flooding relative to our infrastructure associated with coastal storms such as hurricanes and nor'easters. So again, you know, bye-bye freeboard, hello flooding, you know, as the gap just keeps decreasing. You know, we start, let's say, in this case for this, for the uh, climate science special report, we looked at sort of the, the, the event that happens about once every five years, um, sort of moderate scale impacts. It would be about three feet above high tide in Norfolk. You know, some of these underpasses of the tunnels areas uh, happened during Hurricane Matthew. You know, this, is, this isn't uh, minor flooding, this isn't disruptive, this is downright damaging flooding now. So how is that likely to change in time? And so when we look at that, th though I, I would really focus more sort of on the, the northeast here, um, we use a five-year recurrence interval, certain areas in Hawaii, that might even be below the nuisance threshold. So again, it was more of this frequency based on average, but we look at things in the northeast, we're talking about, 
you know, two and a half to three and a half foot flooding. That's that's a lot of water above high tide. The nuisance was maybe where this consistently averaged where I showed it a minute ago is about a foot and a half to two feet. Under the intermediate low scenario or the intermediate scenario, you know, what decade does something happen about once every five years start happening five times or more per year, 25 fold increase. We could go down and say 10 times a year. If you're at slippery slope once you're under a one year return probability. But you can see that we're not that far out in terms of decades as to when this becomes, you know, more problematic and change will need to occur. You can't defend everything. You can put things on stilts, but water still in the streets. So the rest of this key message, a projected increase in the intensity of hurricanes in the North Atlantic could increase the probability of extreme flooding along most of the U.S. coast and <coughs> Gulf Coast states beyond what would be projected solely on sea level rise. So changing what we just looked at in terms of just sea level rise response. Let's say the statistics themselves start changing. Um, the problem is there's low confidence in the projected increased frequency of these intense hurricanes. And so the flood risk could be amplified uh, or offset by changes such as overall changes of storm tracks or frequency. So yeah, they may get, they're likely to get stronger, but the frequency may decline. And really it becomes difficult to really assess that locally. And so what we're really doing here, A, this was taken from the IPCC, uh, where the, other arguments were made with shifting the mean in A. You keep sort of the same statistics, tides aren't changing, storms aren't changing. What is changing is mean sea level. Uh, B would be increased variability, storm tracks, or it became more stormy. Well, we don't really have guidance on that. What we're talking about here is a change in symmetry, maybe more rare extremes occurring more often. Um, that could change our overall risk. But the problem is there's a lot of uncertainty about these extremes to begin with. What is your 100-year event? It's a lot of statistical uncertainty, even with tide gauges. Here, the 95th confidence interval about the 100-year event there is, you know, two, two and a half meters at Kings Point up in New York. So it's really hard to say the population size of one to make these assessments. So even though hurricanes could come strong, what's your likelihood of having a direct landfall hurricane anyways? So it's very hard to, to make that to understand locally what this means about more of a broad stroke changes in hurricanes begin with because there's that statistical uh, component you need to deal with saying, well, locally, what's your risk of being hit by a hurricane, whether the hurricanes increase or not? So there are ways, the North Atlantic Comprehensive Study, the Army Corps, you know, said, well, let's increase the sample size, the population, to come up with a contemporary estimate of today's risk. FEMA does the same thing, base flood elevation. You know, they you have to synthetically model. You increase your sample size from one to maybe 10,000. You rerun, the roll the dice to really see what might happen. If it's able to happen, it could happen, let's do it, not just what has happened. Uh, we did the same thing with the military, this, this regional study for them about their basis, some regional statistical methods that we'll look at. So again, let alone talking about the future, let's get a, a good estimate now. So to conclude, you know, sort of breaking this down, um, the contemporary rate of global sea level rise of about three millimeters a year we're measuring from satellite. This isn't local relative change, this is global. It's not expected to slow. If anything, it's going to increase. Global sea level rise very likely somewhere between one and four feet by the end of the century, dependent upon future ocean and atmospheric heating. Largely a consequential of what humans do. Well, we'll get to that. By 2100, well, if not then, maybe 2150, maybe 2200. It's not stopping. Uh, global rise could top two and a half meters. That would profoundly change lives and lifestyles around the world. Uh, the overall amount of rise will continue to vary along the coastline. You know, more rise in New York City than Seattle. You know, so again, just talking about changes in mean, it's important to understand this and overall risk whether it's the, the news folks want to hear or not. Flooding that's directly attributable to sea level rise is already happening now. It's not an end of the century discussion any longer. It's here, it's now. And unfortunately, these flood frequency are already accelerating in dozens of communities. And it's expected to get much worse rather soon. Extreme flooding will continue to get worse too. Hurricane Sandy happened exactly again 
today or 50 years from now, it's going to be that much worse by the overall height of the ocean. Stronger storms and compounding events such as heavier rains we're starting to see, higher water tables, increased tide ranges, which people aren't really usually computing, will only make things worse. And last, emissions matter. We read in the newspapers, we don't really read about, we read about what locations can do to be prepared, but we don't really talk about the collective change that we could make as a society in alleviating future risk by decisions we make now. Pay now, pay a lot more later. And that is it. Great. Thanks, Billy. That was terrific. Do we have any questions? Folks in the room? Folks online, you can type your question into the chat box. We have a question from Lisa Avron. How many different feedback phenomena are you accounting for in these models? And how do you make political variability measurable? Well, that's a great question. Um, feedbacks, I would have to direct you basically to the modeling papers themselves. But you know, they, they're definitely looking at you know, melting you know, that, that's coming back from the ocean and atmospheric side. But again, as our observations increase, the models increase. And they basically take steps from the CMIP 4 to the CMIP 5, you know, it's, it's those types of changes that are ultimately driving the construct of what we're using. So that, that ultimately is a larger international modeling on, you know, ensemble of, uh, you know, what are being used for boundary. I myself am not the ice sheet modeler, so I would direct you to the primary literature. Um, political variability, that's basically built into these RCPs. And it's really the 2.6, 4.5, and 8.5 that are kind of pre- prescribed that are then used to basically initiate the boundary conditions of these models. Was that that question? Yeah, that was Lisa's. Oh yeah, so John Callahan asks, is the mean high or mean low water rising at similar rates as, as annual MSL, say for mid-Atlantic? Great question, John. John is very interested in, in this, I know, because talking with him about just in general, but uh, for the most part, the changes in the mean drive the changes in, let's say, the high percentiles. Um, though that's not always the case, in this last paper we did in March 2018, we looked at changes in daily variance through time, and we do see some trends, actually quite a few trends. Um, and I know uh, there's some work here at co-ops, and there's been some other work that's looked at uh, changes in tide range, as well as changes in dredging of channels, particularly in some river channels like the Delaware and the Wilmington River and, and and uh, Philadelphia and New York, where you want to get bigger ships in and you increase the channel size, you also allow a larger tidal prism to occur. And so in those areas, we definitely see a change in uh, difference in different rates of change in mean sea level versus, let's say, the mean high tide level. So good question. So that's another feedback, too. We want to have the big ships come in, but have we thought about what that means to flood risk? And there's a really neat paper that looked at that in terms of Wilmington, North Carolina flood risk is increasing due to the deepening of the channel. And they can actually start to look at the tide range changes as the dredging occurred back oh, in time. Wow. Elisa says, thank you. And then Laura asks, what should local coastal conservation commissions know for building and seawall restoration post storms and bank arming to protect property? Oh, arming like banks, like protecting banks. Yeah. Well, what should they know? I guess, you know, looking at it just from an engineering and a physical side of things is you would have a build design that would probably likely span X number of years and what's the hydraulic forcing you're likely to experience at different heights along the way. And so I think, you know, this idea of changing flood frequency at various elevations, I showed here an example at some prescribed levels, what we're calling the high tide flood levels that are kind of basically uh, derivatives of the National Weather Service's minor flood threshold. You could do the same um, exercise for a half foot increments, let's say, so that in a design you could determine, you know, what you're likely to experience over a 20 year design life of, you know, a certain material and what your expectations of that design are. Okay. And then Cosmel asks, what is political variability? I don't know if you want to address that one. What is political variability? <laughs> I think she was, oh, I was, was referring to an earlier question. Oh, okay. I would just say, I don't know. Let's read the news, I guess. Yeah. It seems like there's plenty of it. John Callahan says, thanks, I'll look into that paper. Eastburn asks, how is the insurance industry responding to these projections? Oh, uh, well, that's a good question. Uh, I'm 
Uh, one, I'm not exactly sure, though I know we do engage with the reassurance industry that are interested in this. Um, flood risk uh, on a shorter time period, we know that 100 year event isn't the same from year to year because there's factors that would make you more prone to flooding than others. So there's this time dependent quality that can have some predictability that can vary from year to year. But I think they're quite savvy, obviously, at assessing risk and knowing that as sea level rises, what used to happen maybe once every 10 years starts happening on an annual basis. Um, short answer, I'm not exactly sure. Longer answer, I, I would assume that they are following suit. And I know we get a lot of requests for our data and our projections. So um, somebody out there is doing something with it. Whether or not federally we're doing that with the flood insurance you know, program, that's you know another can of worms that uh, is sort of in the process of dealing how FEMA expects to deal with this. Okay, thanks. And then Krista asks, what impact is sea level rise having on saltwater intrusion in drinking water systems? Is anyone modeling that at the local level? There are. There are several papers out. That's a very good question. Um, South Florida is a, is a great uh, example of where uh, saltwater intrusion is definitely happening. Um, and so they actually have floodgates up to try to keep water out. Um, and keep water in, but with sea level rise and rain, they're having a real problem. But uh, ground, groundwater intrusion, um, you're not only raising water tables as sea level comes in, but you're also, uh, your salt content is definitely increasing. So the USGS is doing some work at, at monitoring this. I know there's been a study with the DOD where they're looking at some islands out in Kwajalein and Marshall Islands looking at uh, the freshwater lenses and how they become disturbed with overwash events that are being exacerbated by sea level rise. That, you know, what's going to force retreat or accommodation first? Is it going to be sea level rise or is it going to be depletion of fresh water due to this contamination? So it's definitely a, a, an issue as we pump groundwater to drink. Not only does land subside, but uh, we also then get intrusion. Okay, and Laura says thanks. And Lisa comments what she meant by political variability. She meant if we have shifts in legislation, local global politics to limit emissions and protect coastlines. Thanks, Lisa. Cosmel says 10-4. Thanks, Cosmel. Eastburn says thanks. And John Callahan follows up with, what is the level of future sea level rise commitment if emissions decrease and temps stop rising in the next couple of decades? The commitment amount usually catches people's attention when I talk to coastal communities. Well, some of the papers come out sort of this long-term commitment, you know, over a course of a thousand years or so, 2,000 years, and it's on the order of, uh, for every one degree C, on the order of two meters, so above pre-industrial. So there is a commitment that's there. The overall rate, you know, obviously is largely uncertain, but again, there is that sort of process once the ocean starts to warm, the feedback with ultimate finding equilibrium uh, is a longer process, but that commitment of approximately two meters per degree C is, is something that has been uh, more or less published in, in several, uh, uh, in the literature. Okay, thanks Billy. Um, and then Tim Mock asks, available help for localities on where to abandon and retreat? Well, um, you know, obviously uh, we're not going to prescribe that kind of, at least I, I dare not say uh, in the position I am in at NOAA, but I think what is helpful is there's two things. And one, you can look back at the scenarios themselves where sea level rise likely to be more than others. And then the other component that, that sort of built into these flood frequency projections and that map I was showing is based on, you know, where right now water level variability is low. You know, people love Florida because it's calm. You know, I-95 South is chock full of people moving south because it's a great place. Besides the in, relatively infrequent hurricane, there's not that much variability in the Gulf in some of these areas. And so you don't really have these episodes that are knocking people backwards, at least like you do in New England and, and areas. And so you have a very rapid change with sea level rise, something that goes from not occurring to occurring all of a sudden is going to be quite uh, profound and quick in certain these areas. But a combination of the variability that typically exists with these projections and elevation, you can kind of, and there are companies that are starting to provide that local sort of tailored guidance, but the products we're starting trying to develop is to try to summarize sea level rise with typical variability with land elevation and land use to kind of, and the U.S. has sort of done this with vulnerability index to kind of get a, a sense as to, you know, where, what's more vulnerable than others right now and, and when you start to put these pieces together. So um, I, I think that's something that's obviously a, a difficult conversation to have, um, especially, 
you know, when we jump right into end of the century type uh, projections where a lot of people are still struggling to understand what does sea level rise mean, I think right now we're really just trying to get people to realize that sea level rise flooding is occurring, what to call it, what to look for, to open their eyes to saying, wow, this is, it's, it's happening. And then once we get to that step, I think then folks can then use the data that we provide to kind of make that smart decision making. And then Diane Bowles Pulver asks, what projects are you working on now that we can expect to see in your next paper or report? Oh, that's always an exciting one. <laughs> 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 well, one, one thing, we are working with the Interagency Seal Rise Task Force that's sort of comprised of folks from across the agencies where we want to try to develop the, the, the products that are going to be useful and that people ask, you know, how much flooding, where and when, and how likely is it going to be, whether it's, you know, next year or two years from now or two or three decades from now. And I think something that's lacking um, right now that we're working towards is to get sort of the probability of the one foot flood, two foot flood, three foot flood, anywhere along the coastline. You don't need to be at a tide gauge. You could be in a, you know, in an estuary here, a coastline here to say, well, what is the likelihood of having this happen? It happens, but you don't really know. You know that a storm comes and it may flood this high, and here's warning, but the storm goes and the, that collective understanding or memory isn't necessarily there, and could we start providing sort of a, a more spatially uniform flood probability uh, layer, let's say, that could be married up to our sea level rise projections so that we could say, okay, your likelihood of your two-foot flood might vary widely across the country, but how is that likely to change with sea level rise? And we could sort of paint the shoreline with that type of information. That would be so that's something we're working on. And Monica G responds to Krista, there is a study on two counties in South Florida that looked at saltwater intrusion into drinking water systems. If you are interested, they can be found here. And she provided a link. Thanks, Monica. And Taylor Schumann says, I-95 South of Miami is not nearly as much of a paradise as you think. Yeah, we'll take you. We'll take your advice on that one. Lots of thank yous. And I have a quick question, Billy. How about for uh, coastal cities and counties trying to uh, start thinking about this, like Annapolis or anybody, anywhere, is there like a booklet that they can go to, like how do I start, I, I'm, a, this, I'm a threatened town, is there a booklet that talks about where we can start? Where uh, they can start, to, what should they start, there, where do they begin? There are, there, so in our sister organization, the National Ocean Service, the Office of Coastal Management have um, several tools that sort of allow for that kind of discussion to occur. Uh, Digital Coast is, is a oh, nice right. one where they, have, they obtain, use a lot of the data that comes from the tag gauges and elsewhere and provide maps and that kind of idea, sort of how to make decisions, um, at least with the information that's at hand. And so at least it kind of begin, is an uh, outlet that can uh, begin that conversation. The Climate Resilience Toolkit is another one that's that kind one. of uh, provides not only the, the water level, but uh, temperature and rainfall and it gives statistics and you know, gives sort of the how-to and, and how best to... Is that you know, a NOAA site, Climate Resilience Toolkit? Yeah, yeah, more or less. Climate Office? Yeah, Climate... Yeah. Yeah. You just Google that. Climate yeah, Resilience, to resilience, resilience toolkit. toolkit. Yeah, okay. And you could email myself or maybe Tracy and we could bundle it together for yeah, websites. Yeah, yeah, sure. Okay, folks, any questions in the room? Any I mean, PowerPoints would be archived in OneNOAA, right? The, the archive for the recordings? Yeah. No, they're going to be archived um, at a, a site up here, and I'll show, I'll, I can send it out. Um, this is the Global Change Research. They're, this is based on their reports, so they're archiving these videos. Okay. I can give you a copy. Oh, sure. Yeah, and, the, and um, some of the PDFs are also archived there. I will email you. Thank you. Sure. Okay. Any other questions? Ah, there's the toolkit. Thanks, Sean. Comments? Well, Billy, thank you so much for a, a scary and exciting presentation. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Thanks so much for joining us, everyone. <laughs> Katie, any last words? Oh, she had to go. Bye, Katie. Hey, any last words? To be continued. All right. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank